ladies and gentlemen, so if anybody has a, a question for, for our panelists, Elizabeth is coming back up to join us, so we're going to need another chair, I think. Uh, so we've gone from squirrel pie to hare's corner. That doesn't seem like a long way. Sure it doesn't. <laughs> but it is quite a long way. Now, so we just have a few minutes of... of Elizabeth, I'm not sure if you were here to, 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 to what Richard was saying about the, the concept of the hare's corner. Yes, no, I was, and I, I mean, that was a wonderful talk, and thank you very much. Um, but um, the hare is interesting, if we're going to go back to sacred food, because it is the Celtic sacred animal. Mm -hmm. So yeah. therefore, you know, that's, that's why it's, it's powerful. And even if we don't know it, it still feels like that. Yes. Around me in Wales, um, you don't you don't kill hares, you don't shoot hares. You go after rabbits, but you don't do hare. Right. How interesting. Yes. Yeah. And also, actually, you know, I, it's sort of significant. It was a beautiful full moon last night, and before there was a man in the moon, it was a, a hare in the moon, and the yeah. the hare was actually the symbol of of Easter, the symbol of fertility. Eostre. Before the the rabbit came back. Yeah. Yes. That's right. why we call it Easter. It's Eostre. is the name of Correct. the. the of the goddess of fertility, death, and absolutely mm. everything. Mm. But, but anybody <laughs> Her will, sacred animal is the hare. But anybody who's ever worked in human resources will also tell you that the times of full moon are when members of staff all start going, hoo, hoo, I can't make it into work. And they go literally kind of a little bit too valley. Hence the mad march hare. Yes. Maybe? Maybe. Bit of an extrapolation yeah. there. Yeah. But anyway, have we any questions from the audience now? Don't be shy. Lady over here, please, in the front. If we have the... Oh, sorry, there's lady here at the start, yeah. and then Madam, uh, you next. I yes, please. I had a question for, um, about a phrase, Danielle, that you used, um, which I really liked, which was, you said, you think we need to be teaching, in addition to agriculture and working in agricultural practice, we need to be teaching people how to eat again. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you could just go a little more in depth into that, and if anyone else has thoughts on that phrase. Very good. Teaching people to eat. Sure. Uh, you know, I think um, a lot of us in, you know, especially the this generation of, of eaters have sort of, uh, you know, haven't been raised to really sit down and enjoy meals. Uh, we eat on the run, we eat in our cars, we eat over our laptops, as I said before. We haven't been taught to appreciate where our food comes from, how it's produced, to have conversations about food, over food. I mean, these sorts of, being a, you know, in, in this little bubble, this wonderful bubble of Bali Malu, you know, where we sit and we talk to people who we haven't met and have wonderful conversations, that's really rare now. Uh, and, and conviviality it has been lost. And, and I think being able to reestablish that, bring that back into our lives and, and creating, you know, family wherever you can with coworkers and with flatmates and, and with, you know, people who are, who are around you, neighbors, and being able to reestablish um, that type of eating will help, you know, res uh, alleviate a lot of the problems that we're seeing today in terms of the non-communicable diseases that, that my friend up here talks a lot about. Being able to appreciate food can um, you know, make us more mindful of, of what we're eating and how we're eating. Elizabeth, I mean, you have lived and cooked and brought your children up in many different countries. I mean, I wonder how your experiences in Europe and so on, you know, you come back then to the UK, where you've been living in Wales for a couple of decades now. How, how, how do you see, in, in, in terms of culture, a, a, a European culture about sharing food as opposed to, say, a situation in the UK? What, what, what are the differences? In, do you agree? Do we need to teach well, people how to eat? I don't think you can, but I think the fact that we want to think that we can and that we talk about it and that we worry about it, I think that shows that the, the desire is still there and that breaking bread together is so strong in our culture all over the world. Human culture, it, that's what it is. When somebody comes to your house, you'll say, oh, um, you know, have a cup of coffee, or yeah. here's a biscuit, or and if people don't accept anything, eventually you say in desperation, have a glass of water. Yes. Because yes. there's this <laughs> urge to, to share something, uh -huh. Uh -huh. even if it's not overt. It's a bit like sacred food, you know. Yes. And we do it when we, we gather together for a festivity. We, we, we want to be together. So that the fact that we still want it, it's really, I mean, the agricultural year, obviously, when you know, you finished in the fields, you went back and you had a, you had a meal. 
I mean, in, in Wales, where I live, it's a shepherding community. Um, life is entirely dictated by the length of the day. Um, you eat at the end of the day, and you go home and you eat together, and then it's usually sort of four o'clock in the winter. Yeah. But when, when darkness comes on, yeah. even song, yeah. And, but in, in France, my neighbors, the Escrew, who were very, you know, they've, they farmed everything. They made their own walnut brandy, for heaven's sake, you know. They had a total farmyard that worked. They gathered snails from the, the hedgerows and popped them on the vineyard, and then they knew what they'd eaten, and then they popped them on the fire and they ate the snails. So there was a kind of a relationship between the territory, but that's agricultural. We now yeah. live in urban but we still have this feeling that we should be doing it, and we look for moments. We invite each other to dinner, yep. you know, and we gather together in restaurants, and then we have beautiful food, and we have a sort of urge to, you know, offer somebody a taste of what we're eating. So that idea of sharing is, you know, is absolutely there. So I don't think we've lost it. I think we want it, yeah. but it's fairly inconvenient most of the time. Eric? Um, well, to add to that, I think also, especially with when we're talking about young people, we kind of, we literally share food now through a different, a different kind of medium, and that medium is social media. If you look at Instagram for the last five, yeah. five years, people share um, pictures of their food when they're having dinner. But it's, what's interesting, we'll go back to the kind of lessons, uh, or trying to how to install the skills, whether that be information about how, uh, how to cook better, or if it's more uh, health information or health promotion advice. Then the same platforms which young people are engaging in now in terms of sharing, sharing their food, quite literally sharing, we can also use the, those same platforms to hopefully inform and make better choices. A great example of this is just this week, Jimmy Oliver's uh, Food Revolution. They, um, sh they had, a, uh, well, had a full day on Friday, and which now extends to a whole, a whole year campaign. But basically on Friday, they streamed kind of cooking lessons around the world, and it was again using, um, using platforms like Facebook and Twitter, which I think it's fair to say, I think over 90% of all young people use on a daily basis for many, many hours. Mm -hmm. So if you can use those same platforms which young people are engaging in now, and to, uh, we can really kind of tap into uh, making these better choices. Bill, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Teaching people to eat? Or maybe just to get back being around the table? Yeah, uh, this is certainly outside of my area of expertise, but I'm happy to share some personal <laughs> stories if you like. Very good, that's how uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, No, just listening to everyone tell their stories reminded me of, um, a moment, I have two, two sons, a three-year-old and a seven-year-old. My seven-year-old grew up uh, most of his life in Zambia where we had a garden and grew, amongst other things, carrots. And there was one day where he was explaining to my three-year-old where carrots came from. And I was very proud that my seven-year-old knew this and could explain that they came from the ground and so on. And then my three-year-old looked at me and said, Dad, why don't we have a garden? And I was like, oh, I only got it half right. But... Uh, <laughs> um, so I just think that's, you know, that, to me that, that was a really proud moment that uh, um, my seven-year-old could do that, but then it also really uh, brought to my attention that children do need to be taught these things, yes. right? It's not yes. inherent, and, and when you grow up with a grocery store and when that's where food comes from, this isn't something that uh, is learned automatically, so... Um, Milk comes from the fridge. Exactly, yeah, yeah. so there's yeah. a lot of... Uh, value in recognizing our obligation to our children to teach them where food comes from. Yeah, I mean, Richard, you mentioned that the college in Kinsale, yep. uh, you know, it, each year is graduating students in horticulture. Yep, yeah, yeah. We that, need more young farmers, don't we? Oh, we, we need, absolutely, We need more yeah. young farmers yeah. to yeah. be saying, being a farmer is sexy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can it remember is. when being a chef was not sexy. You, <laughs> you know, when you I You need one three times a day, yeah. they say. You know? it's a, and it's sexy true. farmers. Yeah, yeah sexy yeah. farmers. Get that calendar. I'm sure there's yeah. one out there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Get the shirts off. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, also... We start with you, okay? Recently, uh, as part of Hare's Corner, I went to school up in Tipperary and did seed sowing because all the, all the classes in primary schools, they were required to do seed sowing. So we went in and we, we did a lot of seed sowing with the kids. And, and for me, I would go to children. I'm at an age now where I realize kids grow up really quickly, actually, you know? So if you get them to sow seeds and seeds germinate and then there's something to eat, you got them you got at it. that. Like, yeah, you know, it's the old really... Jesuitical idea, isn't it? Mm. Give me the child and I'll give you the man. Yeah. But yeah. give me the young seed saver yeah. and seed sewer and yeah. I will give you the adult horticulturalist. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I hope, I hope. Okay, maybe this lady here, sorry, but just, and then a couple of questions over here very quickly. Yeah, you've sort of answered it. it the value of the grow at your own movement in the GIY. first world, yeah, in terms of making people more aware of the value of, of food, you know, the, the real value of, and the satisfaction 
also from, from high quality food. Just <coughs> thoughts on, on that. Mm. Oh, and, and how can I make my one third of an acre suburban farm hold, hold, have hold the better, microphone up there. better soil? Yeah, sorry, how can you? Get better soil in my one third of an acre suburban farm. Richard, invite me for a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's that easy. Okay, I think we have a couple over here now, and we'll... Uh, uh, making compost, you know, is one of the best things in life. It really is. Like, those worms, wow. Hi. Um, I just have a quick question. I, I had a farmer stay in my house uh, last week. He was on the cycle for suicide, and he was a 68-year-old farmer from a Thai. And he spoke about the old farming methods where you planted a crop, you yielded that crop, crop, you sold that crop. But he spoke about the subsidies that are being paid to farmers for basically sitting on their hands now at the moment. And he had a big issue with that. And I was just wondering what you thought about that, that the land is not really being used as it should be used, you know? Um, I'll just, yeah, just if you had any thoughts. Mm -hmm. You get paid whether it's used well or used ill. I mean, farmers mm. used to be fined mm. if they had docks and uh, other weeds on their land. They would yeah. be actually prosecuted yeah, yeah, you'd back in the day. Prosecuted for ragwort is, and stuff Is that, like that for ragwort? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, an example of that would be there's a small far, um, organic grower, market gardener up in, in East Galway and he was getting sort of subsidies um, for, for any land that he, that he was just maybe grazing some cattle on and, and everything. It's like a bad land grant or something, you know. And then he took a quarter of an acre and wanted to grow more brassicas. But he had to extract, he had to take, declare that quarter of an acre. So because he was doing something better, he was sort of getting less. Whereas almost should be the other way around. I mean, garlic, for example, grows brilliantly in Cork. It's absolutely fantastic, you know, and you're going to get 150 for it at least, you know, for, for a nice bulb of garlic. And you're going to easily put in like 2,000 of them into a, into a piece of ground. You know, do the maths, it's, it's pretty easy. It's, a, it's one of the biggest issues I find in this country is that the educational system really didn't like imagination for a very long time and creativity. And that's what we need to bring back. That's what we need to bring back into politics. That's what we need to bring back into farming and teaching and everything, you know. And, and schools have changed so much since I was in school and it's a joy to see that, that this is actually really happening now. So the next generation are going to come along, they're going to be empowered with this imagination. You know, that, that, that's not being as suppressed now as it used to be. And, if you have a 50-acre farm, whoa, it's like whoa. you've got a 50-acre canvas and you can do amazing things and fall in love with it. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. yeah. We invited them down and they, they basically, they looked at, they tended their own little raised bed yeah. there. But it was... They wanted to build a wall there. And we said, look, give us the money that you're going to use to build a wall, mm. and we'll transform it. We'll turn it into something yeah. amazing. And in two years, it has bloomed. It has absolutely bloomed. And I've never seen anything like it in any other cities around the country. But it would be great to, just as an urban regeneration kind of program, take a site that, used, that had five or six houses on it that have been knocked and build something and just, and especially in the, in the cities, because people in the cities, they tend to be a little bit more sheltered. They tend to be, you know, oh, we, did, we don't get out in the countryside all that often. Give them a chance, give them a chance to get their fingers dirty or plant something or just, just roll a wheelbarrow of dirt, you know? It's, it, Lovely, it, it's yeah. Easy. Thank you, we just, lady, I think, lady here, the final, final question please, and then it's time for tea. Hi, this is for Richard as well. Uh, Richard, you mentioned um, there being loads of new growers, young growers, which is fabulous, mm. and farmers who have land and matching the two of them up. How do you see that working so mm, that you question. have... Um, so it works. Thank you. Um, yeah. Dating, agricultural good, dating agricultural service. Agricultural dating. I mean, like one, <laughs> one, one idea that crossed my mind a couple of weeks ago was that with the Hare's Corner, I would really like to be, get it harrowed by horse plower horsepower, mm -hmm. for example. So that's going to attract uh, two particular audiences. In the farming community, you generally, you have the farmer, and then you have, you have granny and granddad, and granddad was the farmer, and now he's kind of, he's doing bits around the place, but he's not the farmer anymore. But he would have a very strong interest in, say, horsepower. 
And then people who are sustainably minded, who have gone to college and learned how to grow things organically and everything, they also have a, a, an interest in sustainable power as well. So that's one example of how you could organize a, an event, get the two people to come together, not necessarily tell them that you know, <laughs> they're, they're on a speed dating mission, but, uh, and then put them together. So any, anything where, you, any idea you can have where you can attract the different sectors from society and just uh, get them having a conversation, you know, get them, get them having conversation is the main thing. I'm not sure exactly yet, but it's, it's coming and I'm very confident and I have a lot of faith that actually, you know, we, we are approaching a critical mass. When I did go to Clock Jordan recently for a, few, a food security conference and I was amazed at the amount of people that came from all over the country and immediately thought, this is like the mycorrhiza in the soil. As soon as these projects are going to join up, like yeah. the whole thing's just going to go crazy. And I, I honestly believe that that is what is going to happen and I foresee that Ireland will be a jewel in the crown of horticulture on a global level because we can do that like here. You know, we are spoiled. In and, and we will also have a much more interesting small ads page in the Farmer's Journal. We, we will, yeah. We will, yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, would you show your appreciation please for my panel, Elizabeth, Eric, Bill, Danielle, and Richard.